All right, so um, very glad to be here. I want to start off with a scenario. So imagine you are the CEO of a large hedge fund in New York City. I work with a lot of them. So they come to us and they say, I've seen this IBM Watson stunt back in 2011. Little known fact, speaking of Wikipedia, Wikipedia is sort of the, the key to success within Watson. There was an entity parser developed by somebody in the late 90s that is highly tuned to the hyperlink structure in Wikipedia. So it's a lot of the intelligence behind the who's the greatest scientist of the 20th century equals you know, fact-finding Albert Einstein. You've seen perhaps in 2016 that DeepMind, the research lab that Google acquired, beat Lee Sedol, who's the reigning Go champion at the game of Go, using its AlphaGo system. AlphaGo is a very clever combination of reinforcement learning techniques, which are machine learning techniques that reward a system based upon long-term objectives and take little short steps towards that end goal, and deep learning techniques, which are a sort of very sophisticated pattern recognition, pattern recognition system to try to find some intuitive connections. Fun, little known fact about Go is that Lisa Dole, who's Korean, when he was playing against it, thought that it had the feel of a Japanese Go player. Um, the moral of the story here in understanding machine learning is that most systems are called, super, they, they employ supervised learning techniques, so they need to have the right answer first in order to train a model that can perform on unseen data in the future. And most of the data that DeepMind used to train its system was from Japanese players. Uh, third image, maybe fast forward 2017, if we have an acute reader of Wired Magazine, our CEO may have seen that the Carnegie Mellon Group following research from Alberta, the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute up in Edmonton, who gets not nearly enough credit for the wins in this space. So they have um, beat four reigning poker champions in, this is the hardest part of my talk, heads up, no limit, Texas Hold'em poker, which uh, I can, it's like a tongue twister. Every time I give talks, I have trouble with it. So this game, um, this is a big win. It's significantly harder than Go, chess, checkers, et cetera, because it's an imperfect information game. So we never know what our opponent, the cards our opponent is holding, is holding as opposed to having everything displayed on our checkerboard. Uh, so it, it can, it lends itself to systems that can bluff, that can apply game, te game theory techniques, et cetera. Our CEO has also seen this. It's a mess. This is Siobhan Zillis's, she's an investor at Bloomberg Beta's machine intelligence landscape. As you can see, we've got a lot of little point startups that are building vertical solutions to solve tiny problems on the left-hand side, followed by, on the right-hand side, attempts at early platform plays to expand data science capabilities across the enterprise at scale. Our CEO has probably taken a trip out to Silicon Valley. Everybody likes to go visit the Googles and Facebooks of the world on their oh. innovation trips, and has learned that they can classify cats. And he says, so what do these games and cat classification techniques really mean for my business? I see this time and again. It's why I have a job. So, so the big question here is, how do you go from the world of theoretical explorations in artificial intelligence, building systems that do a good job illustrating potential capabilities of algorithms and capturing public attention to systems that make money in enterprise. Um, Jeffrey Moore is a good friend of mine, did my PhD at Stanford, and I spent a lot of time with him when I was out there. I was a literature PhD. He actually was a medieval historian and English professor before becoming the Jeffrey Moore that he is. So I think that you know, it's safe to say this is Harvard Business School, so I'm not, I'm not going to go over the theories of the chasm, but AI still is actually in an early adopter phase, and we're not really sure what's going to happen. So, as he says, early apps are really, rarely, rarely killer apps, so it's relatively tough for us to discern where the big impact of AI is going to be today. So some of the statements that I'll say next come from, oh yeah, we can't do animations, come from the work that I do at a company called Fast Forward Labs. We're a machine learning research a firm, as well as an advising and consulting firm for large enterprises that are trying to do stuff with AI. Um, the the uh, animation that doesn't work shows some of the capabilities that we've studied recently, ranging from natural language generation, which are, it's the opposite of natural language processing, so you don't start with unstructured mess and try to turn it into nice SQL-oriented computational bytes. You start with spreadsheets and then automatically write articles, emails, reports that communicate what's interesting in the data sets. So from uh, the, you know, the blind, Tiresias' attempt to predict the future of technology, what we saw in this space was that early attempts to apply natural language generation coming out of labs at Northwestern focused on news writing. 
So they said, what if we automate sports writing? What if we automate SEC earnings reports, et cetera? That created a lot of public interest because you could write articles about robo-journalism and scare journalists about their future career prospects. But in practice, over the last five years, this is now a relatively mature technology. Most of the technology vendors, including narrative science and automated insights, have shifted their strategy and focused entirely on the business intelligence or analytics market. So the sort of core value for the enterprise has not been the press, but rather enabling, to use the jargon, the democratization of data science in presenting insights and data, not in the form of SQL logs or even visualizations, but rather in short sentences that can be tailored and personalized to the CEO, the president, the head of sales, the head of regional sales, whoever it may be, to discuss and easily, you know, easily communicate business insights. So there's a lot of public misperception around what AI is. Part of this dates to the fact that the early attempts at AI in the 1950s coming out of philosophy and using symbolic logic were quite different from what they are today. Today, I consider it to sort of sit at the top of the Maslow's hierarchy of data capabilities, upon which the bottom is what we call big data. Uh, and for those of us working in machine learning, we, we like to restrict this to the term that means you collect, store, and process data cheaply and at scale. So you've got a lot. On top of that lies analytics. You can count things. If you're good at it, you count the right things. Data science is going from counting to counting to be able to support, let's say, quantitative or automated decisions in the future. Machine learning is doing that with feedback loops. And then AI at the top, I like to say that it's whatever computers can't do until they can. So you bake progress into the definition itself because the, the capabilities are changing at a, at a very, uh, fast clip, as we saw with the case study where auton you know, autonomous vehicles are going to come out soon. Computers couldn't drive cars until they could. I think there's a horizon of expectation regarding what could qualify as AI. If we go too far out, we get science fiction, and too far back, we get boring apps. So on that Maslow's hierarchy, the biggest shift, and I think the core obstacle for adoption in enterprise is that when you're doing analytics, you're sort of more on the Janet Yellen side of the universe, and often data efforts are housed under the office of the CFO, where certainty, accuracy, and dependability and reliability are what counts. This is often also affiliated with deterministic systems, Oracle's databases, where the, you know, the compute structure is all oriented towards control and certainty. When one moves into the AI world, we go from certainty to probability, we go from repeatability to risk. Agile processes don't even work most of the time in the experimental phase of doing science, posing a hypothesis, seeing if the data will support a model that actually converges. And this cultural shift from determinism to probability is crucial and very hard. It's also hard for organizations to sort of parse through all of the attention around machine learning and try to identify, based on their qualitative strategy, what makes a good quantitative machine learning problem. I put up these as examples of, of, of those that are sound choices. So AI systems are great at classifying things. The rhetoric around marketing has shifted classification to perception and you know, seeing, the ability to see cats, the ability to see, to see things out in the world. When in fact, from a computational perspective, this is just the same as, is it spam or is it not spam? We just add many more labels, labels that in our human cognitive system are affiliated with language. <laughs> AI systems are good at predicting. This, this is, a, it's a small picture, but um, there's, if one uses Bayesian inference techniques, which are becoming easier to implement thanks to some recent advances in computation, you can predict with affiliated confidence rate and, and uncertainty rates and actually have insights across a full distribution as opposed to just having guesses about the future. They're good at comparing. Everybody knows the recommender systems coming out of companies like Amazon or Netflix. Um, sort of little known thing, uh, these collaborative filtering systems. So Catherine bought something, Catherine's friend bought something that was similar and using our transactional data so as to predict similarities. It's considered to be a solved problem, but it's really not. And there's a lot of huge advances going on today in our ability to discern the qualities of the products that are chosen as opposed to just the transactional behavior of the choosers that I think could lead to some huge changes in the future. And the fourth, I put that as translating for a reason. So this is a picture of a bot company based here in Boston um, having dinner with the CEO tonight. Um, 
And I think uh, conversational bots are best considered translators because they do a good job making, again, the structured world of ones and zeros and computation friendlier in human language. Bad AI problems. So AI systems are idiot savants and not renaissance men. They're very good at one particular task, training a model to perform better on one data set, and they fall very short if you try to have that trained model solve a separate problem. Hunter-gatherers do lots of things. They're not professionalized. Uh, accountants or traders or doctors or all of the, you know, the professions, the, the considered high cognitive professions that exist today. So I, I'll just put this up and I guess it's something we can discuss in the breakout session if one would want to because I find it's a thorny topic and not always worth a lot of time. But there's all of this talk that robots are going to replace us in the workplace. Um, that talk is often hyperbolic and overblown and I think there's a lot of work to be done to parse out what kind of human activity is single-minded and idiot savant-like, hence easily replaceable with an AI system, and what type is actually, actually requires generalist type skills. So there's some unintuitive, I think, conclusions about the, the future of the professions based upon variety of tasks. And the safest place to be today is to be a startup employee where you just have to wear multiple hats because AI is not going to replace any one of us anytime soon. So thank you very much. Thank you.